And once the stock market started getting wobbly in early February, bond yields kind of stopped rising. And they're contained now between 295 on the 10 year, which was the high close, and down at 273. And now we're at 278, which is kind of in the middle. But they do make sense here. One of the most uncanny relationships that most people aren't even aware of is that the yield on the 10 year has been tracking the average of the German 10 year and US nominal, sorry, US nominal GDP almost exactly for the last few years. In fact, it even goes back 30 years that they're pretty close. So it's an indicator that maybe people should get on their radar screen. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the German 10 year, it seems to be pegged at about 50 basis points now. It did break above that and got to 78 basis points. <laughs> But it seems like they're back in manipulating it, so it seems to be uh, found a home at 50. And U.S. nominal GDP is at 4.4, but it's probably going to go higher. Uh, GDP now, on a real basis, from the Atlanta Fed is at 2.8. And so you throw a couple points of inflation on that, and you're about 4.8. And you average 4.8 and 50 basis points, that's 5.3, divided by 2, it gets you around 2.7. And so today we're at 2.78, so that seems about right. So there's basically two ways for the 10-year to break out of this range. One is the German 10-year could push to the upside. It seems very unlikely to me that it's going to push to the downside, mm -hmm. given that there's a negative real rate there. So there's potential upward pressure on the 10-year. And then U.S. nominal GDP you know, could uh, fluctuate. We're not really sure what that's going to be in the quarters ahead. But the yield is sensible where it is right now at 2.78%. So, so uh, it's, go ahead. No, so, so you're not worried... Um, and, and maybe worried is the, the wrong word. Maybe, maybe some people may be concerned that where bond yields are now, it's a reflection that maybe the economy isn't as good as people think. Peter Navarro told R. Kelly Evans the other day that the economy was, in his words, as strong as an ox. Is, is he right? That seems like something of an overstatement. You might have, you might have uh, made a comment like that back in January when there was a moment, actually, that the Atlanta Fed's GDP now is at 5.4% real GDP, which is kind of shockingly high. It's been revised down by 50 percent. But recent economic data has not been as strong as it was three months ago, in particular retail sales, which are somewhat concerning. And the reason that GDP has been marked up uh, from the Atlanta Fed in the last week or two is basically inventory building, which uh, is fine for boosting first quarter GDP, but inventory building can be viewed as borrowing from the future. So to say it's strong as an ox is uh, something of a hyperbole. I mean, the economy is not very different than where it's been in recent years. We've been running at around 2% real GDP for several years. And we're, maybe we're a little bit higher than that now. But to say strong as an ox, I mean, that, that's like saying the, the S&P 500 is strong as an ox. It, it felt that way in January, but now it's negative year to date. So it's hard, hard to say that these indicators mm -hmm. are strong as an ox. Mr. Navarro also seemed to openly question whether the Fed should raise rates three times this year, given the absence, uh, as he read it, of any inflationary pressures. What do you make of that? Well, there has been kind of an AWOL inflation uptick. Uh, there has been one brewing a little bit, but uh, it is hard to uh, say that inflation is rising. There's a lot of reasons from an economic uh, fundamental perspective to think inflation should be going up a little bit. We have a model here at DoubleLine that has been pretty accurate. And our model shows that the CPI will go up to maybe 2.6% year over year come July, but then moderate. So uh, in inflation isn't really there. And yes, uh, there has been a many, many false alarms on the inflation rate going up, in particular wage inflation. You'll remember, Judge, a couple months ago, we got that 2.9 year-over-year average hourly earnings number. It'll be mm -hmm. very interesting to see what happens on Friday. Yeah. Because all eyes will be on that wage number. And, I was going to ask and, you. And nobody um, really knows where it's going to come out. I was going to ask you the importance of Friday's report. Sounds like you think it's really important. I think it is really important. You know, a lot of things have been in consolidation mode. Uh, in the last several weeks. I mean, the bond market, as I said, the 10-year has been range-bound. The dollar, after sliding against all consensus thinking for 15 uh, months, has been stabilizing, but not rallying, right? I mean, it, it fell by 15 points on the Dixie from 103 down to 88, and we've rallied all the way up to 90, which isn't much of a rally. It's a little bit disconcerting when big oversold moves do not uh, get corrected in any kind of impulsive way, but rather get consolidated sideways. And you can say that that's been happening in a lot of markets. I just mentioned the dollar, which after a big drop has only been going sideways. Bond yields 
on a 10-year after a big rise. I mean, 132, as we all know, was the low nearly two years ago, back in July of 2016. We, we, we more than doubled up to 295, but we haven't really had much of a rally off of that oversold level on, a, on the, 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 the 10-year at 295. And also, the price of gold has been kind of off the radar screen. It's interesting how gold can't seem to get any uh, momentum above 1350, yet it doesn't drop. So that's been consolidating sideways. All three of these markets, gold, the dollar, and the 10-year, are intertwined. And they are all consolidating sideways after big moves. You and so it'll be interesting to see which way they break. The other thing that really is the telltale of the markets, which was much in the news. I remember we did an hour show, Judge, here at Double Line. I know where you're back going on with December this. December 13th. I know where you know you're going, going with this. Bitcoin. You, 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 you know I'm right. going to Bitcoin. You, 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 yeah, you, well, you said it. You said it before. Now, Bitcoin's gotten destroyed. Um, and lo and behold, uh, you know, stocks have been puking up uh, in their own right. What investors need to understand is that there is a connection between Bitcoin and the basic social mood of what was speculation is now a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, cautious. Bitcoin peaked about a week after I said short it on your show, December 13th, and it was at 17,250 and it went to 20,000. Of course, today it's on the low of the year. It's down below 7,000. But what's interesting is Bitcoin very clearly leads risk assets, and let's just talk about the S&P 500. Bitcoin started tanking in the middle of December, and the S&P 500 started tanking after uh, January 26. And then interestingly, when the stock market dropped 12% in a very short period of time, actually about four or five days before the S&P 500 bottomed in February, Bitcoin started to rally, and it was rallying sharply, so it led the stock market. And then Bitcoin actually started tanking again from 12,000 a few days before the S&P 500 and other stock indices started to take gas back a few weeks ago. And interestingly, Bitcoin then started, actually on Monday, when there was a drubbing for the stock market, Bitcoin was actually rallying. It was up on Monday and then rallied sharply Monday night into Tuesday morning. And since then, we've had a stabilizing, you know, pretty decent update in the stock market. So what's fascinating is how people don't understand that Bitcoin mm. is the poster child of the social mood and the speculative kind of animal spirits. And so it's interesting to watch it. Unfortunately, Bitcoin is now on the low of the year. It's down very significantly uh, uh, today. So it kind of shows that the volatility in the stock market that I've been talking about, I mean, I tweeted it out back when the NASDAQ hit its all-time high that day, and it seemed like maybe the coast was clear, and a lot of people were talking about, you know, this bad dream was over about volatility. You'll, you'll notice that volatility is not gone at all. Right. In fact, we're in, a, we're in a new regime of volatility. I remember back in, uh, in the summer of last year, we talked about the VIX being below 10 was not something that was going to be sustainable, and that my highest conviction idea was that volatility was going to return. And I recall people saying that the VIX would never go above 15 again. Pretty interesting. In the investment business, Judge, when you hear the word never, never. we all know it means it's about to happen. It means it's imminent. Run, and so, run for of the course, the VIX, that can't, moment. Yeah, the VIX can't seem to settle down. So we're in a volatility regime. This is completely obviously different from what we experienced in 2017. It's payback time. 2017 was the easiest investment year of all time. Mm -hmm. The risk-adjusted returns of the stock market were the, probably the best in history. And of course, this year, as I've said before, we're gonna have a negative year in the stock market. In fact, right now we have a negative year in just about everything except commodities. So you still, you still believe really you still believe we're gonna have a negative year in the stock market because you, as I recall, um, you've been fairly constructive on risk assets as long as bond yields didn't get away from us. Now, you know, I don't know if it's the geopolitical um, events that, that are in front of us that make you think that, but why now are you, are you thinking there's going to be a negative year for stocks? Well, I said that back in January. The, the thing is that when the stock market was near its high of the year, but the thing is that the stock market can't take higher bond yields. And the, the line in the sand that we talked about in the past was 263 on the 10 year. And I said that if we break above 263, it's going to be trouble for stocks. Mm -hmm. And boy, was that right. I mean, the second we went above 263 is when stocks started to get wobbly. And then we rocketed higher on the tenure, as we thought it would, towards 3% once we broke above 263. We didn't quite make it to 3. We made it to 295. But call me a liar for five basis points if you want to. <laughs> but the 263 level was really problematic. And I, and I think for stocks to really have a chance of regaining their footing, you need the tenure to go below 263. And I really don't think that's going to happen. Because we, we're looking at a lot of uh, leading inflation indicators, and none of them are scary exactly. 
but they all show that one should expect that we'll see higher inflation from the CPI in the months ahead. We have a, about five, six indicators that give us a leading indicator on the core CPI. One of them is real GDP. And real GDP leads CPI with a correlation of 0.79, which is very high. And it leads it by about 18 months. And real GDP started to go up 18 months ago. So we should expect CPI to be moving higher. Another gauge is the New York Fed's underlying inflation gauge, the UIG. That also has a correlation with a lead of about 16 months of 0.8, which is, again, very high. That started rising about 16 months ago. You can look at PMIs that have a leading aspect to them. They suggest inflation should rise, not by a huge amount, and maybe only temporarily. Who knows? But it shows that inflation should go up, which means with CPI likely to print on the double line model at 2.6, for the July month year-over-year -year number, it's really hard to see why the 10-year yield should drop below 263. And that's really problematic. Now, stocks are in a very interesting point because there's something that's old school that's called the Dow theory. Yeah, I was going to ask you about and that. And the Dow theory, yeah, the Dow theory is by Charles Dow, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And basically the theory is that the, the transports, which used to be called the rails back in the day of the railroads, the railroads, the rails, the transports, and the Dow Jones Industrials if they get in sync on the upside or the downside, the Dow theory says it's very important. So there's been a Dow theory buy signal for a long, long time. There hasn't been a, a bearish indicator from the Dow theory in forever. What you really need is for both the Dow Jones Industrials and the transports to together take out the, the, the recent low. And that almost happened on Monday. It, it, was, it was going to happen, but the late rally on Monday stopped it. And the transports did not take out their low, whereas the Dow Jones Industrials long ago took out its low. So it's interesting that at 10136.61, to be precise about it, that's the level on the transports. If they close below that and the industrials close below their low of February, then you have a Dow theory bear signal. My suspicion is that will not happen unless the 10-year Treasury retreats again and the yield goes above 3%, which is really the issue of the day. Is the 10-year going to break out of this range below 263, or is it going to go above 3%? I don't really have a lot of conviction on this. Uh, I think the odds favor a break to the upside, but I, I really, I, if 5 is neutral on a scale of 1 to 10 yeah. of my conviction, I'm, I'm like a 6. Well, I mean, I'm barely there. Well, that's why. So I'm going to let the market... I'm going to let the market do the talking. I mean, 322 on the 30 year is the level, uh, you know, underlined, bold faced in italics. It's the level. And amazingly, and I've been talking about this for months, and amazingly, we closed exactly at 3.22 on the 30 year, and that started. The, the moderate bond rally we've had since then. Even so more reason, it'll be interesting to see if we take that out. Even more reason why Friday's report, um, wages and jobs and everything else, is, is so critical. What do you make of the, of the trade stuff that's going on in, in D.C., what happened today and uh, in, the, in the past couple of weeks? What's your take on it? Well, it's not, it's, it's, it's not a positive. I mean, it's really interesting. When I was in, in elementary school and high school, we talked about the Great Depression. And what they said, my, my teachers told me, was that the Great Depression was caused by the Federal Reserve raising interest rates prematurely uh, in, in a weak econ in a not so strong economy, and also the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act that ended up uh, causing a big, you know, policy mistake. And it was interesting because what the teachers told me in elementary school was obviously we've learned from these lessons of the 1930s, and we're never going to do that again. Again, here's the word never. So here we are, and we are raising interest rates late in the cycle. Uh, we have a, a yield curve that is now inside of 50 basis points, twos to tens, which historically, when you go through 50 twos, tens, you pretty much always end up going flat or inverted, which typically leads to a recession. So we got that going on. Later on top of that quantitative tightening, which in fiscal 2019, which starts in October, could be as much as $600, $600 billion dollars of quantitative tightening. And on top of that, we're now talking about tariffs. So one can put together a scenario that we're making, uh, we're, we're stumbling our way through into a policy mistake. And that's perhaps what Mr. Navarro was talking about, that maybe the Fed shouldn't be raising interest rates three times this year. However, I will point out that the bond market is pretty copacetic with the idea of the Fed raising rates three times this year. If you look at the shape of the front of the yield curve, it's basically saying, yes, bond investors think it's okay for the Fed to raise rates three times. And in fact, they're even okay 
with them going to about two and a quarter on the Fed funds rate for the end of 2019. So it's interesting how the bond market seems okay with this, even though we have some indications on a historical precedent back to the 1930s that suggests that uh, you know, a trade war with the Fed tightening, with quantitative tightening, maybe uh, a recession will come during the Trump administration, which of course would be historically likely, given the fact that this is the second longest economic expansion in the post-war era. Right. So if, if we do get a recession, one has to think about how radically the world will uh, appear to be to people, since we're already talking about a 1.1 $1 to $1.3 trillion deficit, thanks to the tax bill and further spending increases for 2019. And we have 600 billion potentially of quantitative tightening, which could mean that we have something in the order of $2 trillion of treasury bonds being floated in fiscal 2019 potentially, with corporate bond maturity starting to ramp up, and all of this going on, right? So what if there's a recession on top of that? What if we actually have lower tax receipts that are put into this calculus of a $1.1 to $1.3 trillion deficit? What will happen? Will we really continue with quantitative tightening? I mean, these are the big issues. I got and this you. is so not surprisingly why the stock market is now showing massive volatility. You know, there's a reason why Death Valley, the lowest spot in the lower 48 states, is right next to Mount Whitney, the tallest spot in the lower 48. That dirt from Death Valley has to go somewhere, and it's right next door. There's a reason why 2018 is so volatile. It's because 2017 was the least volatile year for a 22% S&P 500 return in history. And so people should not be surprised by the fact that the paradigm has shifted, and sure. this volatility is going to be let with me, us let for me a ask long you, time. I've got less than a minute left, um, so let's keep it, keep it brief uh, from here to the close. Are you still long commodities, and are you short any equities? Yes. Uh, I am actually net short equities in my macro fund, and I have been uh, for a while. I, it was painful in December and January, but it was so obvious to me that Bitcoin is the, is the dot com of our world today, and that this mania is uh, so, so, so similar to where we were in 1999. And now we've, we're seeing this, the symptoms of a reversal with all this volatility. Mm -hmm. So I think. It's not a great idea to be, you know, leveraged long in the equity market. Frankly, I, I think returns will be negative for this year. That's not a radical right. statement anymore, given the fact that the market's down year to date. You got it. We'll leave it there. Jeffrey, thank you as always. Thank you for having me, Judge. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.